Hey, my name is Jack. I'm from Priory Church. I've been to the youth pilgrimage four times and my favourite things about it was meeting up with mates and doing the Holy My Walk. first we're all here father philip's here and his camera's working his sound's yep. working it's going yep. really all ready well. to go great guns yeah. yeah it looks like he's had a wash it's all no, fine th thank you yes <laughs> well, it's our scheduled zoom how many weeks has this been going on for how are you doing how's the lockdown been for you oh. you know what sorry i've got so many questions but i haven't been getting out much <laughs> yeah, you can say that again. Do you know, this lockdown feels like it has been going on forever, doesn't it? And I'm missing being with real people. I mean, this is all very well and good, all this Zoom stuff. But actually, what I really miss, um, I miss you guys, you know, I miss, I miss being with people. And I really love the youth pilgrimage. It is such good fun because, like... You know, I really love camping and, uh, you know, the joy of sharing a tent with you, Father Paul. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, you know, Reb and Rachel in their caravan crowing at us as, you know, as we slum it. Um, but the joys of the communal loos and all that kind of stuff. You know, I might even put up a tent in my back garden. Anyway, I'm not convinced that you will put up a tent in that back garden. I've seen that posh London back garden of yours. But what have you been up to? <laughs> Actually, that's very true. It's concrete, so I've got no space to put my pegs in. And really? well, uh, I've been, uh, you know, been watching television. I've been watching box sets on uh, Netflix. Um, I have uh, done all sorts of stuff, but mainly I've just been getting bored. In fact, so bored that I've even been reading again. And Ooh. I've been reading, hold on, bear with. What's he, what's he wearing? Oh, God. Father Philip, are you wearing your pajamas? Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, you weren't supposed to see that. Oh, well. <laughs> yes, I have. Well, you know, I've not really I've bothered to, you know, with this bit, because this is all the camera sees. Well, nobody um, does, do they? Working from home, it's great. I, I am still in my gym jams, even <laughs> though it's, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, what have you been reading, anyway? Oh, I picked up this. Ooh. Really? Yeah. Why? Right. Well, I, know I, did, I did look at it once in university and uh, theology <laughs> college, um, but I thought I might I just refresh my memory about uh, some of the stories. And I started to look about this chap called Paul, not you, but the intelligent Paul, the Paul who ah. wrote lots of stuff. <laughs> well, that Paul certainly did write a lot. He was a great writer uh, to the early Christian communities right around the Mediterranean, just as the church was getting started. In fact, he was a great encourager and a great teacher of the faith. But you know what? It wasn't always the case. He wasn't always like that. Oh. Um, how do you mean? He wasn't uh, always a follower of Jesus because, I mean, the, the bits that I've got to, it calls him an, an apostle and uh, surely, you know, the apostles were like, you know, the original 12, weren't they? Well, no, he wasn't. He wasn't one of the original 12 at all. 
he actually didn't like Jesus and his followers at all to begin with. In fact, in the Bible, we first meet Paul in the Acts of the Apostles. And back then, he was called Saul and not Paul. And he was a Pharisee. And according to the Acts of the Apostles, he was on his way to arrest Jesus, uh, to arrest some of the followers of Jesus in prison and possibly execute those early followers because he didn't like them. He didn't like what they stood for at all. And it was only after meeting the risen Jesus in a blinding light experience, we've heard a lot about light this week, that Paul literally does see the light and he becomes one of the biggest supporters of Jesus ever. Really? That is wow. quite a change, isn't it? <laughs> it's an amazing yeah. story. <laughs> like I said, he literally travelled around lots of countries telling people about Jesus and he wrote loads of stuff in the New Testament, that's the back bit of the Bible, Father put it, okay, to all yeah. different <laughs> early church communities in Corinth, in Galatia, in Ephesus, in Philippi, in Colossae, in Thessalonica, and even in Rome. Uh, Father Paul, you've just made all those places up, haven't you? There's, there's no way that those places are real. I mean, I know that Rome is... I've because been to Rome. It's lovely. I've been to Rome. It's lovely. You know, had lovely ice cream, lots oh, of nice architecture. I... Did a bit of, did a bit of sort of thing. Oh. But um, I can't believe that any of those other places are real. I'm sorry. Yeah, they are. They're real places. Do you know what? I've been to some of them, and you can too. You've just got to broaden your horizons. Oh. <laughs> All wrote to those early Christians and supported them as they began to tell other people about Jesus. Do you know what? He did a great job. You said you were reading from his letter to the Romans. Yeah, I am. Now, some of what Paul writes isn't always easy, and I don't understand all of it, because, as you know, my reading age is not so good, um, but I am, I am kind of, you know, plowing on, because he makes you think, doesn't he, this Paul chap? He does. So tell me, what bit of Romans are you reading? Well, <laughs> um, just so happens that I'm reading chapter eight, which no. is very, Ooh. which is very good because we're looking at it today, and it's all about the life of the spirit, and it's all about future glory, and about God's love in Jesus. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand all of it, and there's some of it that I get but just listen to this bit that is from verse 18 of chapter 8 onwards. I'll read it because I've got it here in front of me. That's I have to read things aloud otherwise I don't seem to take it in. Mm, go on. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our, bod our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope there is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep forward. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Still I mean, hard, I mean, though, isn't it? It is. I mean, I, I mean, I think that sounds really beautiful, but I'm not quite sure I know what it means. Uh, well, in a way, it's about us playing our part in the world. The creation is waiting for us. 
to show ourselves as God's children. We are God's children, certainly. But we are also people of the world. The world God created. Remember the story from Genesis yeah, uh, earlier this week. God's good creation. Well, that world, our world, suffers. Think about it. You only have to look around you, watch the news, listen to the radio, to know that God's good creation is suffering. Mm. Yeah. This is not what God wants. This is not why Jesus came. He came to redeem the world. Redeem meaning save. He came to save you and me and all creation. As we heard about yesterday, he came to bring light to set us free and to bring all and all creation to a new birth in him. So I think I understand that a bit, um, that, that kind of, you know, we all have a responsibility for taking care of the world, that, um, you know, that who I am and, and my kind of, you know, what, what I do is tied up with God's purpose for the world. And that's, you know, I kind of, I get, I get that. But what I don't get is kind of, what I can do all on my own and how what I do might make any difference to what God wants the world to be like. Well, of course, that's the rub, isn't it? You're not on your own. You are never on your own as a Christian. You have God's spirit inside of you. And you are part of something greater than yourself. You are his child and he puts his trust in you. So you, we all need to learn to put our trust in him. He is our loving father and his love for us never fails. And together we can and we do make a difference. So is this, I mean, is it saying that um, we are all we should be a people of hope? Yeah. That we're people who kind of put our trust in God, that, you know, we're not on our own uh, because God's spirit is alive and at work in each one of us. And that God wants the whole of creation to be renewed, to be changed, to be, to be brought to, a, um, to its fullness in him is that is that sort of what it's about what do you think 